Yo, Snapchat, let's discuss retrofuturism and historical futurism and how the technology of our time shapes the way we think about the future, whether it's optimistic or dystopian. Let's go. Okay, firstly, somewhat unrelated idea. Um, on the walk down, I saw a whole bunch of school kids, and I, I immediately thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool if, imagine if every day they had someone new from the, from the community come and teach them. Rather than having a set curriculum and one teacher for the entire year, every, every day it could be a different person um, from the local community or anywhere in the world who comes and just like wants to teach them something that they're interested in. That would be so cool. I'd love to spend like um, a whole day just teaching 30 kids about the future and technology and stuff like that. And you could do something with your own interests. Like you'd go in and teach them about agriculture or um, okay, shit, to segue that back, so imagine you gave kids from today uh, an exercise to uh, draw what they think will happen in the future, draw their most exciting future vision. It would be incredibly interesting to see what they come up with, like would a lot of them use things like smartphones and computers and maybe flying machines and stuff like that, and then how would you compare that to kids in the 1900s? If you do a search for predictions in the 1900s, like future predictions in the 1900s, um, everything's very mechanical, very uh, industrialized, lots of steampunk type stuff with steam engines and yeah. That whole retro futurism, like historical futurism, is fascinating because it shows uh, clearly that people's ideas and, and con conceptual ideas and ability to think of the future changes over time. It also kind of shows that our imagination is very much limited by the uh, technology of our time um, and the kind of uh, the culture of our time, I guess. So, for example, the desire to fly seems to be like an innately human uh, thing throughout the ages. If you go back into the 1900s, there's a whole bunch of like flying contraption machines, but they're all very mechanical and steampunky. On the retro futurism art from back in the 1900s shows a lot of like personal flying machines um, and a lot of like hot air balloons, lots of ropes, lots of like pulleys and mechanical structures, and yeah, it's really cool. Whereas when we imagine like uh, personal flying contraptions today and other flying devices, we think of like you know jet engines and quadrocopters and electric motors and bursts of air and stuff like that, hoverboards. And obviously, if you grew up in a time without electricity, um, your ability to imagine different products that can use electricity is very limited, if not you know non-existent. Um, whereas now we just take it for granted. But imagine what it must have been like to be an adult and coming across electricity for the first time, you know, seeing electricity for the first time. That would have just been absolute magic. Wow. Whereas today, the vast majority of us were like born into a world where electricity is just like the norm. And so we all take it for granted. And yet it's this magic thing that just like, we don't understand how it works. Like we understand the science, but we don't understand, like <laughs> when you want to charge your phone, you don't, you're not thinking, oh wow, it's this magic electrons flowing and all this back end stuff. You just plug it in. It brings up that quote of like, any, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's so true, especially back in the day, but moving forward even more so. I think um, a good distinction too with like uh, futurism and concepts in the past as well was that they were very kind of understandable. Um, they were mechanical in nature, so you could, you could see every part and you could make it yourself. Whereas today our technology is so complicated and uh, so advanced, it's very much like a black box. We don't understand what's happening. I mean, it's impossible for me or any individual to understand what's happening in this phone right now. It's interesting because that probably has an effect on our optimism or our pessimism for the future. I mean, uh, back in the, the retro-futurism nostalgic age, it seems like they were very optimistic about the future. Like living through the rise of the industrial era would have been amazing because you would have actually been able to see all the advancing technology in very physical form, like you know, big steam engines, big factories. And I guess the sense that you could like actually DIY, you could see the moving parts, you could jump into that system and be able to work out what's happening, um, and then get excited about what could be done next. So that's why we have all these like you know, uh, all these pictures of flying contraptions from the 1900s using all these very mechanical structures and steam engines and stuff like that. Whereas now technology is advancing at a far faster rate, like orders of magnitude more than what it did in the 1900s, but it's largely hidden um, because it's operating at smaller scales in black boxes, so we don't see it. In the past too, I think with fewer technologies available uh, to think about and combine, you have fewer ideas and imaginations about the future, which is easy to predict the future, but less accurate. Whereas now we have like countless uh, technological branches branching off into different areas and then converging with each other, and so it's become incredibly difficult to predict the future, but much more able to do it accurately. Particularly now that most technology is an information-based technology, Oop, all over. Um, which means that it's exponential in nature because it feeds off itself. Um, you use the tools you make to create the next tools and so on. So for example, unlike predicting flying cars and when they'll be possible, it's much easier to predict exactly what computational power will be available in the future if you just look at the natural trend of Moore's law. Another thing that heavily affects modern day futurism is uh, media. And you know, think of all like the sci-fi movies and the whole like Hollywood blockbusters um, and the internet and videos and everything. 
in the last century you had a lot of sci-fi writers but the vast majority of them were talking about topics that were kind of like more abstract in nature like far far future say like a thousand thousand years out and so i think while many of the sci-fi novels of the past were still dystopian they're at least like far enough in the future and uh, abstract enough concepts that they didn't seem to hit home to most people Whereas you look at sci-fi movies today, and the vast majority of them are just massively dystopian. Um, and they're always talking about some type of AI or some robot uh, basically destroying the world. And that type of sci-fi, I think if you went back in the past and showed that to people in the 1900s, they'd be like, oh, that's, that's so far out of my, my world that, you know, it's not a threat. It's going to happen, you know, a thousand years from now. Whereas now society, when robotics and AI and machine learning and NSA surveillance and all this crap is realistic and happening now, we see those movies and we think, okay, maybe that'll happen within our lifetime. So that's surely going to have an impact on people's uh, optimistic versus pessimistic view of the future. And I tend to think that the vast majority of the population at the moment has a very pessimistic outlook on the future, which sucks. So I fundamentally believe that the future doesn't just happen, it's actually created by people um, who are crazy enough to have an imagination or come across an imagination that they agree with and pull it into reality. But that first starts with imagination, and the problem is that humans are incredibly bad at imagining things, particularly as we get older. As kids, we're great at it, and then it's kind of like ground out of us by the education system. I find myself constantly hitting the limits of my biological brain, the ability to imagine the future. It's like I'm trapped in a bubble. Much like people in the 1900s were trapped based on their own technology and view and culture, I'm trapped as well. But all of us are. All of us can only um, imagine ideas that we've come across before. I don't think we can think of original new ideas. We can only create new ones by combining two existing ideas together to create a new idea. And of course, we're limited by the technology of our time, which is like smartphones and the internet and AI and stuff like this. These sound like amazing, great concepts, but in 20, 30 years, they'll be like old concepts. This is why I think it'd be amazing if all of humanity actually came together as a collective and imagined the future they want, and then we kind of made that happen together, rather than just letting the entrepreneurs do it. And if collectively we're pessimistic about the future, then nothing's going to happen. Like, who wants to build a shitty future? No one wants to build a dystopian future. Everyone wants to build a utopian future, a protopian future, an optimistic future. And so it would be awesome if everyone became a futurist, if everyone imagined the future and then kind of we all collectively worked out what we wanted uh, and what future idea was the best and combined ideas and then made that happen. Because the awesome thing about being a futurist in futurology is that any imagination is going to happen inevitably on a long enough time scale. If you just remove time from the equation, so long as it doesn't break the laws of physics, it'll happen. So our only limits are our imagination, the, the time era we're in, that little bubble, um, the technology we have on our hands, whether we're an optimistic or a pessimistic culture, and the laws of physics. Oh yeah, and the only other limit is our phone battery, because mine just died at the beach. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Snappy thoughts, a future.